Guess what I'm, or way I'm going to uh, present this tonight is a little different than what I usually do as well. Uh, I told you I think Wednesday or sometime or another. I guess I need to make another announcement here before I get started. Though last, uh, I guess last Wednesday night, the pastor mentioned he'd have a good speaker here tonight, but he didn't show up, so you're stuck with me. But. Uh, you know, usually when I speak, uh, we have a subject we're talking about. And I told you, Sunday night or Sunday evening, I'd be preaching, uh, not preaching, I don't preach, but I'll let Elaine do that. Uh, I'd be speaking on the power of prayer. Then I got to think about it, well, maybe it should be the promise of prayer. And then I put it, uh, why we should pray. And you may remember back in... Uh, October of 2007, I spoke on proper prayer. I know y'all remember that, don't you? Well, you, it's not going to be a rerun. It's going to be entirely different from what that one was about. 
But we often hear people who have doubts or maybe questions about prayer, what we need to pray or what good is prayer and things of that nature. I mean, let's face it, uh, we'll say we have a loved one that's, you know, ill, pretty sick. We pray for them and they recover. What do we say? Our prayers are answered. But if we take that same loved one that's sick, we pray for them and they don't recover. What do we say then? It wasn't God's will. Well, if it wasn't God's will that they uh, would recover, wouldn't it also be God's will if they did recover? So why do we pray? And I think I have, I think it's five questions along those lines. Before we look at the answer to the questions, and every answer to the question comes out of this book, and every example illustrating the question comes out of this book. So you're going to hear more from this book tonight than you will from me. But first, let's take a couple of minutes to see what prayer is not. Prayer is not a means of bargaining with God. I mean, you think about it, what do we have that we can use to bargain with God? We can't even guarantee our next breath. We can't even guarantee our next heartbeat. So what do we have that God would want from us? Prayer is not a means of making demands of God. Sometimes we pray like we're, we're asking God to do that, or not asking, but telling God what to do. It's, it's not a means of making demands of God. It's not a way to control God. You know, God is a supreme being, and who are we to think we can control God or tell him what to do? But that's often how we pray. You know, if our prayer is not answered, well, God didn't do what he should. It's not just a means of asking God for things. We can pray thanking God. We can pray praising God. But most of the time we pray for things, don't we? And probably most of the time those things are for us. And especially not a way to show off one's spirituality before others. If you look in the Bible, most of the prayer is done in private, isn't it? In fact, Jesus said one time he got up early in the morning and went out alone in the garden to pray. But uh, sometimes it seems like we want to show our spirituality by how well we can pray. With these, we need to, when we pray, we need to have the right attitude, the right uh, method and all. And if I don't have to uh, think I have to cut it out, we'll look at why our prayers may not be answered all the time as we go along. Now why should we pray? Well, one reason is God's Word tells us to. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, I've even heard some say that amounts to a command, that we should pray. It says, uh, We should bold, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The psalmist said, O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name. Proverbs 15, 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Did you ever think that prayer is a delight to the Lord? Matthew 26, 41, and Jesus is speaking here. He says, Watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Not only does God's word tell us, but Jesus himself tells us to watch and pray. In Luke 18, 1, speaking of Jesus here, it says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 21, 36, Jesus speaking again, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And then the Apostle Paul also tells us to pray. Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. In his letter to the Colossians, continue in prayer and watch the same with thanksgiving. In his letter to the Philippians, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication 
with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then to Timothy, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then James says, is there any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Now in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, we come to the second question. And here Jesus is speaking this way. He says, but when you pray, now you notice he didn't say, but if you pray, he said, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, and here's, here's the part, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So it raises a question, if God knows what we need, then why should we have to pray and ask for it? He already knows, and I've told you before about the time I received a check for, I don't remember what reason it was, it was, I guess a couple, three hundred dollars. Thought I had some extra money. A day or two later, I walked down to the basement and there was water squirting out of the water heater. I said, well, there goes my money. When I should have been thinking, God knew I was going to need a water heater before I did, and he provided the means for it. And as some similar probably happened to every one of us. So, what do we need to ask? Well, James gives us the answer to that, doesn't he? James 4, 2. Yet you have not, because he asked not. And I'll give you an example. The example is found in Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. It says, and it came to pass that as he, being Jesus, was come nigh to Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. So if you get the picture here, the blind man sitting there by the side of the road, maybe had his cup out for people to drop something in. He hears this commotion coming down the road with maybe this unusual noise. He asks what's going on. It's a natural question, isn't it? And someone there tells him this, this, this is that Jesus of Nazareth. Well, apparently he's heard of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the man who's made the lame to walk, the deaf to talk, the uh, dumb to talk, the deaf to hear, and the blind to see. So he says, uh, he cried out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. How many times have you been told, we don't talk about that around here. Two things we don't talk about is politics and religion. You know, it can be rebuked today if we're talking about Jesus, can't we? But he and it says, uh, but he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. Now remember what Jesus said, the Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now what did Jesus usually do when someone approached him for his healing power? He would say, come to me or do this or do this or whatever, wouldn't he? What did he say this time? Command him to be brought unto me. What does that tell us? Jesus knew he was blind, didn't he? How many of you think that Jesus knew what he would ask? That's what the scripture says, isn't it? And it continues on, it says, And when he was come near, he asked him, Jesus asked the blind man, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Now I have a question for you. How many of you think this blind man would have received his sight if he had not called upon Jesus? I don't think he would, do you? So why should we pray if the Lord already knows what we need? We need to ask, don't we? And here, here's a uh, third one, third reason we have questions sometimes, uh, and we may have heard this said before. Why should we pray we're not going to change God's mind? 
Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And repent means change his mind, doesn't it? Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So that's pretty much backing up what they say, isn't it? It says right here that God doesn't repent, doesn't change his mind. Why should we pray? But then let's see what the Lord said to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 18, 5 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, this is Jeremiah speaking, O house of Israel, can I... Cannot I do unto you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant shall I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant shall I speak concerning the nation and concerning the kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it be not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So what did the Lord do here? He said, if circumstances change, then I will change in him. If I pronounce one thing and the circumstances change, then I will change what I'm doing. And that's, I think we can say that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Circumstances change. Now it's true, God doesn't change. His character doesn't change. Uh, he makes a promise. We can depend upon that promise. He's not going back on his promise. But these are other things that God says. Now I have two more. Uh, examples for you. Isaiah 38 verses 1 through 6. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Hezekiah was dying. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Syria, and I will defend this city. Now what did the Lord do here? He tells Hezekiah, you're going to die. And then the Lord uh, repents and says, you're going to live fifteen more years. What circumstance changed the Lord's mind here? There's not one, is there? The only thing we see is that Hezekiah prayed. Now we say, why should we pray if we can't change God's mind? I guess you need to ask Hezekiah the next time you see him, shouldn't you? Second example, and this is even a little harder. Exodus 32. And then we're going to read verses 6 through 14. But uh, kind of bring you up to date here. This is uh, right after Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're there at the foot of the mountain. You recall the Lord looked down and spoke to Moses and said, Come up on the mountain to me and uh, leave the people down at the foot of the mountain. This is when Moses received the Ten Commandments. So he went up and was on the mountain with the Lord. The people were down below. And people run out of patience real easy, don't they? The people started uh, saying, what happened to Moses? He's not coming back. Maybe a mountain lion got him. Maybe he fell off a cliff. So they go to Aaron and uh, say, Aaron, make us a new God, one that we can worship and follow. 
Now, you remember when they were in Egypt, Pharaoh wanted to hang on to them, but the Egyptians were so uh, tired of all these plagues that were breaking out on them that they were eager to see the Jews leave, weren't they? They were so eager, they even took uh, their jewelry and precious metals and gave it to the Jews to take with them. So Aaron tells the people there, said, bring me your gold jewelry. And he took the gold jewelry, melted it down, and made a golden calf. And he said it before the people, so here's your new God, and worship him, or worship it. And why, how do the heathen worship? You can imagine what was going on, because they were, worship, they were idolaters, they were worshiping an idol. In the Lord's eyes, they were heathens, carrying on, as the world carries on even today at times, having a, having a good time. And the noise reaches all the way up to the mountain where Moses is with the Lord. In verse 6, we pick up verse 6, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. The Lord says, just plain as you can say it, I'm going to wipe them out. He's not mad at Moses, he's still going to, uh, give Moses a, a great nation to lead, but he's going to get rid of these people down to the foot of the mountain. And Moses besought the Lord his God. Now what is prayer? It's simply talking with God, isn't it? And that's what Moses is doing here. It says he besought the Lord his God. We would probably say he prayed. And said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore, should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he had thought to do unto his people. What was the circumstance here? The Lord was pouring his wrath out upon the people down at the foot of the mountain, wasn't he? Did they change? No. Did they pray to the Lord? No. And it was Moses that prayed, wasn't it? So why did the Lord repent of his people? The only, thing, the only answer we have in it, it was Moses' prayer that changed. Now this was a, to me even, I couldn't find an answer or an explanation of why God says he wouldn't repent. I can understand that he could repent. He says, you know, we read where he said he would repent if the circumstances changed. But in these last two things, circumstances didn't change, really. It was simply prayer. And uh, Monday, I even called, uh, I called Pastor, well, I really called, well, I called Pastor Jones. I had a question for Mary Jones, so I'll get to here in a minute. But while I had him, I asked uh, Pastor Jones about this, what's the explanation? And at the time he explained it to me, it made sense. But that was two days ago. But I think, and it probably, we probably talked for 30 to 45 minutes. It was a pretty good while. And they were driving and they would, you know, fade in and out at times. But if you really, you know, remember that on Wednesday evenings, our pastor's been speaking on Calvinism and speaking on the tulip, the which are the, the, foundation, I guess, of Calvinism. TULIP is an acronym that stands for the five principles that guide the Calvinism, the Calvinists. The T for total, uh, total depravity. Man is, you know, just totally evil, is what he's saying. The U is unconditional election, which uh, God does it and man doesn't. L is limited atonement. Uh, eyes, irresistible grace, 
and we've gotten through, I think, to the L so far. We'll get to these others, I guess, in the next couple of weeks. P is a perseverance of the saints, or probably the same thing we call once saved, always saved. Um, how they get around the whosoever's in the Bible, I don't know. I saw where it said that whosoever occurs 183 times in the Bible in 163 different verses. Now some of those times are in the Old Testament where it's speaking of other things, but there's quite a few of those times when it's speaking of whosoever will, isn't it? Now, the problem with Calvinism, they look at the sovereignty of God and say God is sovereign. Well, they're right there. God is sovereign, isn't he? He's a supreme being in the universe. But they say his, uh, the sovereignty of God is such that everything that happens or nothing happens unless God causes it to happen. It goes so far as to say you're not even, you know, God created us with the free will and the ability to make changes. And what we choose to do either pleases God or uh, does not please God, isn't it? And when we please God, he reacts one way. When we displease God, then he acts accordingly to that way, doesn't he? But they look at uh, nothing happens. If you're saved, it's because God said, I'm going to save you. And you're lost because God said, you're going to be lost. You have no choice in the matter. Man, man can't do it. He doesn't have the ability to do it. Well, that's not what we believe the Bible teaches. It's what we know the Bible teaches. It's up to us, whosoever will, whosoever believeth. And uh, that kind of in a nutshell is what's going on these last two examples here. These people, uh, Hezekiah made a choice that was pleasing to God. He came to him in prayer, weeping. Uh, when Moses prayed to the Lord, it was something that uh, the Lord could appreciate, and he reacted according to that, uh, to what Moses was doing, not what the people down below were doing. But I think we can see from these two examples that prayer can change things, can it? Even the mind of God. And when we speak of the mind of God, we're using human terms to speak to a God that's not human. I mean, he's far beyond what we are. But for our mind to even be able to grasp what we're talking about, we use, you know, human terms. So, another excuse. Uh, another thing here uh, uh, backs up prayer is pleasing to God in First Timothy. Paul says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And then sometimes we say, I don't know how to pray. I don't have the words, I don't know how to pray. Well, the scripture tells us how to how that is way, or Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh us intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I had a session here uh, probably looking at five reasons why our prayers may not be answered, but I think I'll skip it because time is running away from us. I want to spend the next uh, few minutes speaking of pretty much the same thing, but using a personal experience that Elaine and I had that we went through. So instead of speaking the experiences through here, it'd be from us, a personal experience. And I know we've all had personal experiences. On October the 27th, 1994, I was at work in my office. I received phone call said it was an emergency call and at that time I had been asked to work on a special task force 
and the office space they rounded up for us was in the Duke Power Building in um, Archdale, right off 85. So that's where I was this morning when I received a phone call. The guy on the phone identified himself, gave his name, said he was a Stokes County EMS. I don't know if I was the father of Sean Venable. I said, that was. He said, Sean had been in an automobile accident. I need to call uh, Baptist Hospital emergency room. Well, I did like I think any other person would do. I asked, how badly was he injured? He said, I don't know, but they airlifted him. And, you know, there are certain words in English, or phrases in English language that get your attention, aren't they? Airlifted is one, especially if you're speaking of someone's sickness or injury. It'll uh, get your attention real fast. He said he was airlifted to Baptist Hospital. You need to call the emergency room, speak to the charge nurse. And he gave me the number. I never even heard the term charge nurse before. But I called and I got the charge nurse. I, I assume that's someone's maybe in charge of the emergency room. She told me that Sean, had, he was there, they were preparing him for surgery. He had a broken leg, broken jaw, and a closed head injury. She also told me they had him sedated uh, in a medically induced coma so he wouldn't be thrashing around and creating further injury. I got through with the phone, I told the administrative assistant where I was going. The, the only permanent person on that task force was the manager to be in charge of it. And, he was, I think, in Spartanburg, South Carolina, wrapping up his old position, kind of working two places at the same time. So I told her to let him know where I was, and I got in my car and left. So I was coming up, what was that, 64? Come from Archdale to Winston, I believe it's 64. I uh, pulled out my phone and called Elaine. She was at work over here at Camp Haines. Told her Sean had been in an accident. Of course, she did the same thing I did, how badly was he injured? Said he'd broken leg, broken his jaw, and had the bumped his head, you know, hit his head, and they airlifted him, and she went all to pieces. And I said, Well, there ain't no way I can ask her to drive to the hospital in the shape she's in. So I was thinking, I'm going to have to go all the way to campaigns, get her, and then drive all the way back down to the hospital. But the, some of the ones there in the office heard her and called enough of it, and uh, managed the director of campaigns there told one of the other ladies to bring Elaine to the hospital. So I was free to continue on to Baptist Hospital. And on the way, I took the advice of uh, the Apostle Paul, the advice he gave the Church of Thessalonians. I started praying without ceasing. I said, Lord, let him be all right when I get there. Lord, give me the strength to bear whatever I find when I get there. Lord, let him be all right when I get there. Lord, give me the strength to bear what I find when I get there. And, I mean, this is, if you think about it, this was a little over 28 years ago. I have trouble remembering 28 minutes ago today. So some of these things are a little fuzzy, but I think you'd normally take, what, 20, 30 minutes maybe drive from Marshdale to Winston. That day, it's like it took all day. When I finally got to the hospital, parked in the parking deck, and someone showed me how to get to the emergency room, and it's not where it is now, or I guess it's still where it is now, or where, <laughs> last time I was down there. But it was backing up somewhere, I had to go down a long hallway, and at the end of the hallway was the waiting room, which was actually part of the hallway. I got there, wasn't anyone in the waiting room. I walked around the corner, there's a lady sitting there at the desk. Uh, Told her who I was while I was there. She said, you know, they're getting ready for surgery. I said, while well, you're waiting, I sit down here and take care of the paperwork. You know, you got to have paperwork for everything. And I sat there, you know, giving his name and age and insurance information all, and Elaine came around the corner. We finished the paperwork. They told us, okay, you can go see him now. So they took us around another uh, corner there, I guess, and there was Sean laying on a table, a bed or whatever. All you could see was his head and his elbows, maybe his feet, I don't remember his feet, but he had, he was covered with what looked like one of these big long uh, pool floats, you know, that you lay on in the pool getting sunburned. I guess it may have had 
more water in it, something that'll keep him warm. You look at his face, there was no movement at all. You could, I don't know if you could even tell he was breathing. His face had uh, scratches and cuts on it, and abrasions. He was swollen. I looked at the elbow, I was standing on one side, they lay was standing on the other side. And I looked at his elbow, it was just a constant drip, 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 blood. And there was a puddle of blood right there at my feet. We stood there looking at him for a few minutes. And suddenly, for some reason, I knew he was going to be okay. I mean, from that moment on, I never once doubted, never had any occasion to doubt that he would get better. Every day we were there 16 days, and I think every day we saw further evidence that he was improving and getting better. And I don't recall any instance of anything that would cause us to doubt or, you know, we were taking a step backwards. They came and finally told us we got, he's ready for surgery. He said, you need to go back around into the waiting room. So we walked back around the corners and all there, back out into the waiting room. Now there were two people standing there. Pastor Jones and Miss Jones. And you know when you need them, they were there, weren't they? I still, to this day, don't fully understand how they got there almost before we did. I mean, I know they got the word. Somebody maybe heard it on the monitor or something. They got word and probably out running around, and there they were. We were standing there talking, and the doctor came out and talked to us. And he was telling us about the leg. They were going to take care of it. They would take care of his jaw, have to go in that was jawbone, they had to go in through his jaw and put a screw in there, put a plate and fashion his jaw back together. They wired his teeth together to immobilize his jaw. Put a steel rod in his leg. Didn't put a cast on it, just had the steel rod. And then he was telling us about the head wound. And I think their main concern there, and that seemed to be his gravest concern, was the head wound. Uh, he was going to school that morning. He was a senior at North Stokes, going down uh, the road, uh, down there just before you get to George Road, then down a hill, and hit a patch of ice. And this was the morning when there wasn't any ice. In fact, the highway patrolman uh, came to see us there in the emergency room, said he was going to give Sean a citation. And there was a lady behind him said, no, he wasn't speeding. He was, she was catching up with him. She was behind him catching up with him. She carried him up there and showed him the ice on the road. They had just uh, paved the road, resurfaced it, and it was a little high drop off to the shoulder. They hadn't filled the shoulders up yet. We think Sean hit that patch of ice that kind of sent, sent him off the side, and, and as people commonly do, oversteer something that shot him back across the road and he slammed into a tree. Stern wheel was bent. He had a blue streak a brown and blue stripe down his chest where the seat belt caught him and then I think maybe he hit his head over the windshield. He was there in the hospital and while and while this guy was talking to us we were standing there taking it and the doctor told Elaine later I don't know where I was at the time I don't remember it that uh she probably took it as calmly as any mother he'd ever talked to but uh Romans 5 1 which was part of our Bible reading last night, if you're reading it. It said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God is what we have when we accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. We're no longer at enmity, or there is no longer enmity between us and God. But Philippians 4, 7, Paul said, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I think it was the peace of God that answered to my prayers. Lord, let him be all right. Lord, give me the strength to bear what I find when I get there. And that's the way it went. It's the only uh, excuse, explanation I have for it. <clears throat> uh, after the doctor left, we were standing there talking to Pastor Miss Jones a little bit, and you could tell Miss Jones Kind of, I guess she thought we was in shock or something because she kept, we were talking about it, and she kept trying to make us aware of how serious the situation was. And both of them were pretty well disturbed as well. But we knew he was getting better. And uh, that's what we were talking, and then we looked down the hall, and here comes Jason. Now, Jason was a senior at UNC Greensboro. 
we hadn't even thought about calling him. But his roommate was also a graduate of North Stokes, and he, he had a sister at North Stokes. And she got word of Sean. She called her brother. He happened to not have a class at that time. He looked up Jason's uh, schedule and went and got Jason out of class. And Jason got in his car and drove to Baptist Hospital. The Lord's good, and he takes care of things sometimes before we know we need them. Kind of reminded us we need to call our parents, so we took time to, Elaine called her parents, and I called my mama. Then we, uh, after that, we were there a total of 16 days. 13 of those days, Sean was kept in that medically induced coma. Five of those days, he was in the trauma unit. And I'd like to share two instances that took place in the trauma unit. You know, got about two minutes to do it all. But we were there, we could go see him twice a day, once in the morning and once at night, uh, 15, maybe 15 to 20 minutes at a time. I think there may even been a limit of how many people, but they didn't really enforce that. But the time I'm talking about, probably on the third or fourth day, I took Pastor Jones down there with me. And uh, you could walk in the door, and Sean was right straight against the back wall of his bed. They had, I don't know, maybe eight or ten or twelve beds. All of them had, you know, the curtains, drapes they could draw, uh, pull around them. We walked in the door right straight across the room to Sean's bed. Sean would be laying there, you know, sound asleep. He'd say, Sean, Sean, can you hear me? And his eyes would pop open. But they were just as lifeless as they could be. They weren't focused, his pupils looked big as quarters. And it's like looking down a deep well where you couldn't even see the bottom of it. We didn't know if he could see, didn't know how well he could see, didn't know how well his brain was working or how damaged, what kind of brain damage he may have. The doctors were still telling us about that. But when we walked in the room that day, the, his nurse came over and handed me a stack of get well cards. Pastor reached, took a card off my, out of the stack I had in my hand. This one right here, if you can see it, I don't know how well you can see back there. And he walked over to Sean and he said, Sean, look at this, tell me what you see. Now we were thinking Sean may say rocks, or he may say water, or maybe say a river or something. Sean, what do you see? Isaiah 33, 3 says, Call upon me, and I will answer thee, and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Sean, what do you see? Sean said, Jesus, the great physician. I looked at the pastor, the pastor looked at me, we both looked at the card, and neither one of us had noticed the writing at the top of the card. And that one thing there, we were shown that Sean could see. We were shown that Sean's mind was working, he could read. And best of all, we were shown, even though he had some great doctors and some good nurses and all, that Jesus was a great physician. He was the one in charge. Now, on many occasions when we would visit, when the visitation was over, we'd go back up to our, the waiting room, which is right up the hall, about like from here to the doors there, maybe. We would stay out in the hall because we were excited. We were jubilant. We were celebrating just like when he talked to this card. Here we didn't know what he could see and he could read even, way beyond what we were hoping for. We stand out in the hall laughing and talking about it and celebrating out of respect for the people in the, emergency, in the waiting room, because there were people in there who were crying, who had received, you know, at least uh, no good news, if not bad news, of their loved one. While we were there, at least two of them lost their loved one. One of them passed away while we were there talking with Sean one day. So we'd stand out in the hall. The second occasion, real quickly if I can, uh, there was an occasion when Sean had two visitors two boys from school. One of them was Ben Harrison, Kathy's youngest son. The other one was a, another friend named uh, Jamie. You remember Jamie's last name? Stowe. 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 I, Sean's told me, and I never can remember it. 
but Ben and Sean and Jamie and another boy named Robert were the four musketeers. I guess they'd been together ever since Nancy Reynolds. They were seniors in high school. I believe they're all in the band. And here Sean was laying in the hospital. So we told them, if you just wait just a few minutes before visiting time, we'll take you down there to see Sean. And we explained to him Sean's condition, that he was in a medically induced coma. He wasn't very responsive. If you spoke to him, he'd open his eyes. He would give you one-word answers, but he wouldn't carry on a conversation. At that time, he didn't know me. He didn't know his mama. He didn't know the pastor. He didn't know Miss Jones. Although there was a... One time, when uh, we asked him about Miss Jones, I said, Who's, you know this lady over here? And he said, it's Miss uh, Sequest. And I don't know where he got Miss Sequest from. But that, he said, that's Miss Sequest. It's something else we could stand in the hall and talk about, I guess. But we walked in there, and Ben and Jamie stopped down at the foot of the bed, and I walked up to the front and spoke to Sean, told me he had some visitors. He opened his eyes, and I Call them on up there. Their eyes were a little red and a little moist because this was their friend laying there. And you can, you know, we were there every day seeing him. He had a tube up his nose, a IV, and hooked to the, you know, the usual monitor there showing your heart rate and all that. They walked up there and I said, Sean, look, you have this. I said, do you know who this is? Sean looked down and said, it's Ben and Jamie. He didn't know me. He didn't know his mama. And we didn't care. He knew Ben and Jamie. Told us something else about it, the shape his brain was in. He was getting better. That's another day we spent some time out in the hall. After that, if you give me another five minutes, well, I'm already five minutes over, but after that, they moved into a room over in Brenner's. And all the rooms up there were two patients to a room. They put us in the room, just us. Even left an extra bed in there and told us that as long as it was possible, they would leave it that way. Sean would be kind of disturbed, uh, like he was tormented, frustrated, especially if he started waking up. It was hard to contain him. Twice we had to call security to help keep him in bed. Once when Pastor Jones was there, he got that way, and I was holding on one side of one arm. Pastor Jones had the arm on the other side. He picked Pastor Jones up off the floor with one arm. Of course, Pastor Jones was not a very big man anyway. The hospital thought they could handle it, and they put him in a straitjacket. He came out of the straitjacket. We didn't see any more of that straitjacket. Uh, on day 13, he, by the time for his medicine, the nurse walked in with a needle for his IV, and I asked if they could let him wake up, see how he handled it. She checked with the doctor and said it'd be okay. And then he woke up soon after that. And, uh, when he was there, of course, the first thing he wanted to do was get that tube out of his nose. And he like asked the nurse about it. Said the nurse turned her back and said, "I don't see anything." Said Sean took that thing, pulled that tube right out. He was awake and still can't talk and all, a little confused. I think one of the first things he wanted to do after he woke up within a, that day or maybe the next day, he wanted to go to the bathroom. We asked the nurse about it. Said, "Yeah, he can go." Out and went and got him some crutches. I don't know if Sean had been on crutches in his life, but we got him up and said, now, you got to be careful, Sean. You can't put any weight on that leg. It wasn't in a cast. It was just bolted together. First thing he does is try to take a step with that leg. So we finally get him to the bathroom. He comes out. We knew he was getting better because he came out and he was complaining about the toilet paper. He said, you might as well get some sandpaper. Um, day 16, they told us we were going home. I went and get the car while Elaine was packing up the things. Now, we had spent all this time at the hospital. We came home twice. Sometime, I guess, shortly after we got there, changed clothes and got us a, packed us a suitcase. We ate in the hospital. We showered in the hospital. We slept in the waiting room or in Sean's room after he got there. After he was in the room, we had to come home again one time and get a new suitcase full of clothes. The rest of the time, we were in the hospital. On day 16, I told us we could go home, so Elaine was packing all of our stuff up. I went to got the car, pulled it around where they told us to meet him. Normally, when you discharge from the hospital, they get an orderly or a volunteer or somebody 
push in a wheelchair and roll you out. When I pulled up there, there were five or six there with Sean, the doctors and nurses. As two of them were helping Sean into the car, one of the young doctors there, and the law that I guess maybe the title term would be interns, but uh, one of them leaned over to me and said, whispered and said, uh, remember, this may be as good as he ever gets. Now, he wasn't speaking physically, he was speaking mentally. And they wanted to send him to therapy, but we said no. Elaine definitely said no. They wanted to send him to Charlotte. We sent him, he did some therapy there in Winston-Salem for a week or so, a waste of time. Uh, we took him home. He was at home for the rest of November, December, through the Christmas holidays. First of January, he went back to school, still on crutches. He graduated in the spring of 95, graduated with honors. In the fall of 95, he went to UNC Charlotte to, hoping to get a degree in computer science. In between graduating from high school and going to Charlotte, he had two more surgeries. Uh, he contacted, well, it wasn't really a surgery, one of them, but he uh, somehow or other he got MRSA, which is like a, a type of staph infection from his leg. The type he had comes from foreign objects being inserted into the body, and I guess it came from that steel rod. You can get it from a catheter or that tube down his nose or any foreign thing is, you know, inserted into the body. It's uh, get it from hospitals mostly. So we had to treat him for that. We did it at home for six weeks, twice a day. We had to hook him up to the IV. He had a porter cath in. We had to hook him up. Had to lay in bed there for about an hour till it dripped in. After that, it, uh, or maybe first before that, he had problems seeing. And when he hit his head, he had some blood in his eye. They told us it would dissipate on its own. But he started having trouble seeing and found he had some of that blood had dried in his eyeball. So he had to go to an eye doctor and they stuck a needle in his eyeball. It gives me shivers more so than open heart surgery, I think, sticking a needle in the eyeball. But they had to stick a needle in his eye and draw that dry blood out. He went to his first semester at UNC Charlotte, came home at Christmas, had a red spot on his leg. He drove himself to Dr. Teasdale's office. Dr. Teasdale was the orthopedic surgeon that had dealt with him setting the leg and all originally. Dr. Teasdale called Elaine and said, I gotta take Sean over to the hospital. We're gonna have to do more surgery. He had MRSA again. They had to take the steel rod out. It was put in within 10 of being permanent. Had to get some bones, they call it broken, or dead bone spurs out from the original injury. So went back up, had to treat him again. This time it was for 12 weeks, two cycles of six weeks each. I told Dr. Teasdale when he was telling us about this, I said, you know, he's, he's in college, he's got a second semester to go, which he wouldn't be able to go back to. I'd already paid his tuition and room and board, and I said it's already passed the deadline when I could ask for a refund. Dr. Teasdale said, don't worry, I'll get your money back. I wrote to school, told him Sean wouldn't be coming back because of surgery, but he intended to come back, you know, the following year to pick it up after he recovered. I don't know what Dr. Teasdale wrote him, but in a few weeks I got my check back, full amount, so two or three thousand dollars, whatever it was for a semester of college. God is still good, isn't he? He went on to get his degree in computer science. Remember, this may be as good as he gets. Sean tells me that computer science majors in the junior and senior year take the same courses that electrical engineering students take. And it was heavy in math. It was math I never heard of before. I didn't even know the question, much less the answer. But he graduated with that. Now I have to say that it wasn't our prayers alone. We heard from people we didn't even know, didn't even know how they knew us. We heard from churches that we didn't know, didn't know where they were, tell us we were on their prayer list. And we heard from you folks. While we was in the uh, trauma unit, a young lady came in there one evening wanted to speak to us, step out in the hall where we'd have some privacy, and I figured she worried about the money. But she was, her concern was that if we would have support when we got home with Sean. And I told her, we lived right next door to Elaine's mom and daddy. I had her, my mama, 
brother and sister lived in Pinnacle and another brother in Greensburg, it's a family. But I was thankful to be able to say better than that, I have a church family. From the, you know, a lot of times in situations like this, you feel like you're, it's just you all by yourself. I guess from the time we walked around that room in the emergency room and saw Pastor Miss Jones there, we can't say we were ever alone. Uh, I guess Pastor Miss Jones were probably there every day, or at least most of the days. Uh, John, the director of campaigns, was there just about every day. Some of the church family was there multiple times. Some of you brought whole bags of biscuits. Some of you brought fish meals for us, and they had a good cafeteria. Uh, it's not like they have today, but it's more like uh, K and W, and the prices were even reasonable. We had people look us up while we were down there in the cafeteria eating. Had people call us on the phone, crying and worrying about Sean. I spent time with one one time, 15 or 20 minutes calming her down and trying to encourage her. You remember it? You. <laughs> Judy was, was about crying, worried about Sean, and I was trying to tell her he's all right, he's doing good. But as, uh, I don't know how people make it at times like that without a church family. I really don't. After we got home and all, I guess W.J. put it best. Uh, W.J. Booth is, was he like his daddy. But he said, I do not know, I did not know that I had so many good friends. And we were blessed greatly. The doctor said, remember, this may be as good as he gets. God's word says, call upon me and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And I have to say, that's exactly what he did. Does prayer work? Yes, it does. Do I pray as I should? No, I have to plead guilty for that, I guess. But it's not because I don't believe in prayer. It's not because I don't believe prayer works. It's just something I need to work on. I expect we all do. But prayer does work. God does hear our prayers. And... Uh, God does answer our prayers. It may not be the way we want, may not be in the time that we want, but he does answer our prayers. And I guess now that I'm probably 10 or 15 minutes over, we probably won't get around to our prayer request, but uh, Pastor will be back next Wednesday and we do it then. I uh, appreciate you listening to me. Uh, Brother Randy, would you dismiss us in prayer? We'd like to thank you for joining us today on our live stream service. We pray that you were encouraged, that you were blessed, and that you were challenged by God's Word. If we can be of any assistance to you, please feel free to reach us at our email below. We pray that you have a wonderful day, and God bless.